Heavenly Father, we just praise and thank you for your amazing love. God, we thank you that we can still come and just worship you. And Lord, we just pray for our service this morning. Lord, we pray for an anointing on barriers that just brings us your word. Lord, we pray for a time as we go. Yes, Lord, we know things are very different. But we thank you for the freedom that we still have to come and freely worship you. And we pray, may we never take that freedom for granted. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So morning. So one of the first things that we have to do every time we meet together is ask you, have you filled in the register and had your temperature taken and had your hand sanitizers? Because if you haven't, please, now's the time to do that. Did you do it, Tony? Just, just, okay, just checking. You know, I like your haircut, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, Tony, you're not playing along here. Um, yeah, so as you know, things are very, very different. But one of the things, we can still come together. We can still just worship God. And part of that is, is just hearing how things are going in our community. So we just want to always open up this time. Has anybody got a testimony that they would love to just bring at this time? Or maybe you were just reading this last week and God really said something to you. And we, we're going to give you like two minutes, Max, to come and just share with us quickly. Yeah, so it's not planned. Anybody got something they would love to share with us? This morning, or do I need to pick on somebody? Anybody? Stanton, you're more than welcome. Can I hold a mic for me? Sure. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> uh, good morning, saints. Good morning, uh, believers, all the brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Um, you know, at the start of this lockdown, um, there were dif different thoughts went through your mind as to what's going to happen. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to our friends, uh, church people? And then, yeah, God knows it all. He knows everything. Um, he knows our tomorrows. And I just thank God that um, I found my comfort and my direction, my guidance in God's Word. Um, went back to, to the book of Esther. Um, as a family, we just went back reading through the book of Esther, one chapter at a time, uh, one chapter per day. And uh, what, what encouraged me was the faith of Mordecai. Um, at, at a time where the, the Jewish nation, their, their lives were under threat by um, the, 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 the power of the day, which were the, the Syrians. Um, and, and God, um, in His mighty power and through His wisdom, Strengthen the heart of Mordecai to not lose his faith and strength in the midst of death, in the midst of annihilation, the Jewish nation take the possibility of the, the Jewish nation being taken out. And the words that he told Esther is this, is that if you are not going, going to intervene, help will come from elsewhere for the Jewish nation. That strengthened my heart and immediately my, um, my, my thoughts went to Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts I have toward you. It's thoughts to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope in a future. Those words were written to those who were in cap captivity. And, Je and, and Mordecai, I believe, he always had those words of the prophet Jeremiah. That letter was written to them. He always carried it in his heart. That no matter what, lockdown, shortfalls, lack, no matter what, God will always provide, and God is faithful. I thank God for, for His faithfulness to His Word. Bless the Lord. Thanks, Stanton. Anybody else would you want to bring a message to us this morning? Anyone? Um, and then I thought it would just be fitting to go into a time. So I'm not going to do this, but I'm just going to kind of offer a time that we know that there's a lot going on at the moment. And so it's gotten to the point where when COVID-19 first struck, it was like, oh, people in Joburg or people in the Western Cape that were, were getting infected and we're hearing about this. But now it's actually people that we know. And I'm sure sitting here, all of us know somebody that's been infected or affected by this disease, whether it's been locked in or anything like that, or, or there's just crises happening in people's lives. And we're kind of going, you know, what about those people? And one of the amazing things that I love about our faith is that we can stand in the gap for those people. So we're just going to take a time now and just be quiet for two minutes. And if you want to just call out somebody's name that you know really just needs to be uplifted right now, feel free just to call out their name. 
the amazing thing is that we know that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. So sometimes we don't know what to say more than just, God, we give you this person, be with him. And so we're going to go to time now. I've just been quiet for two minutes. And then just, if you know somebody that you want to bring before the Lord, just call out their name in this corporate time of prayer. So let's do that now. Lord, we just pray for all of those names that were mentioned now. And Lord, we know that there's so many more as well that maybe we're just a bit embarrassed or, or not really sure what's going on, Lord. But we just give them to you right now and just ask you just to be with them. So Lord, we, we stand in the gap and we don't know what to say. And we just say, work in their lives. Be with them. Guide them. Comfort them. Support them however they need it. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so then the last thing that I have the, the privilege to do is to kind of lead us into a time of worship. And so, yes, we know it's very, very different because we're not allowed to sing, but I'm sure you're allowed to hum behind your marks if you want to hum along to the songs. But part of our act of corporate worship is also giving as well. And so you'll see there's a basket in the front here. And so just before the worship songs start playing, we want to encourage you to please come to the front and just hand in your worship, your tithes, your offering, whatever it is. And this may be very different for you because you're kind of coming and going, I don't want people to see me. But it's not about that. It's about actually us coming before God's throne room of grace and saying, God, thank you for what you've given us. And here's just a small portion back to you. So thank you so much. We're going to go into that time now of giving of our corporate worship and then just into a time of worship. And then Barry's going to come up straight after the worship song. So thank you so much. So when you're ready, feel free to come forward and give your offerings.
truth of them. Lord, thank you that you truly have overcome. And Lord, thank you that we don't have to overcome in our own strength because we have your Spirit. Thank you for the words that John wrote that you needed to leave so that your Spirit could come, that your plan would be fulfilled. And Lord, we thank you that we can, be, we can call you Father. We can call you Abba, our Dad. Thank you that your love for us exceeds even our own understanding. Thank you that this morning, Lord, we can worship you even during this time. These few of us could be together in this building declaring the name of the Lord. And Lord, as we open your word now, I pray too that your truth would be declared. That it wouldn't be the thoughts of men, the, the, the word written by men, but inspired by you. For our teaching, for our edification, for our discipline, for our encouraging. And so Lord, I want to commit your word to you. May the tree achieve every good plan that you have for it. May it teach us. May it inspire us. Lord, may it excite us too. As we look back at the history of Israel and see, Lord, a people that have so many times distanced themselves from you, yet you were always faithful. Lord, that no matter where they went or how far they turned, you were always faithful. And Lord, thank you that we too are no different from them but you are still faithful to us, even when we are unfaithful to you. And so, Lord, would you use this time now to, yeah, to excite us, Lord, about your word yet again and inspire us for the work we still have to do. Lord, let us be reminded that this coronavirus is still under your control and that in it we can do great things because, Lord, you've opened so many doors during this time for us to do your will and to perform your work. And so we commit this service to you now, Lord, as part of our worship, to honor you and to glorify you, for you are the only one who is worthy of that. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to, to open the, the word up. I must say, I'm really looking forward to the day when we're full again, when we're able to, to sing those, especially those two songs, to sing them, Lord, you have overcome, not to be humming quietly behind our masks, but to be able to sing that with gusto. But let's get into to the word for this morning. We, we finished the book of 1 Timothy and we will get to 2 Timothy later on probably in this year or early into the next year. Um, looking at the whole book of 2 Timothy is around the gospel and defending the gospel. But as we finished 1 Timothy looking at some of the basics of church, we're now going to go back to the Old Testament. We need to just keep our balance, Old and New Testament, remembering that every word is inspired and so every word is valid for our teaching and for our edification. And so we're going to go to the book of Judges for about seven weeks. There's seven judges and so we're going to look at all of them and their influence into the life of the Israelites. And then after that, just so you know, we're going to go into about a seven week series then to looking at Ephesians chapter 6, dealing specifically with spiritual warfare and how that is worked out, looking at all the different aspects of the armor of God and how we live in our lives as people of purpose, but looking at the spiritual side and how we deal with the attack of Satan. So we're going to be looking at that after the book of Judges. But as we get into the book of Judges, then we remember we went through the book of Joshua and specifically looking at becoming a people of purpose. Because that's what God was doing with the Israelites. He was taking them out of captivity into a new land, this promised land for them, to become the people of purpose to fulfill the plans that he had for them. And Judges is, is in a way, a continuation of that. Unfortunately, Judges is not the greatest of books looking at the history of Israel. Because it's a book of, of confusion, it's a book of, of judgment from God, it's a book of disobedience. Even as part of their taking of the promised land. And, and I want to really continue as we go through Judges, looking at them, reminding us that our journey as Westway, our journey as Christians, as people of God, should be a journey that is becoming a people of purpose. That should be our ultimate goal, is becoming the people that God wants us to be. And so our journey through Judges will remind us again 
that we are gospel-centered and Christ-focused. That is the whole ministry, the whole vision of our church. Our whole lives as Christians and as a church centered around the gospel in every aspect of our, of our world, the gospel de- de- determining our thinking and our actions and for us personally living lives submitted to God, obedient to God, and consecrated to God. Remember how many times we dealt with that in the book of Joshua. Submitted, obedient, and consecrated. But when we get to the book of Judges, we see a people taking the promised land, and it should have been a time, I think, when we get to where we should be, there should be almost a sense of satisfaction, a sense of achievement. And when they got to the promised land, it should have been a time of, of joy, a time of, of great happiness, filled with goodness. This was the land of milk and honey. And the Israelites should have been, I think for me, even closer to God. They should have seen God at work. They should have seen God's promises coming to bear. They should have seen His providence. They should have been living this life, almost this dream that God had promised them. And they should have been in a place of obedience and consecration and submission. Yet sadly, the book of Judges is not that. The book of Judges is actually a time of destruction because of disobedience. To think about what God had done for them. As we look back to Joshua, he's rescued them from, e- from Egypt, done this incredible work of getting them out from under the, the oppression of Pharaoh, opened the Red Sea, got them through the Red Sea, got them to, to the Jordan, got them past Jericho, all these incredible things. He committed to them as, he's, as their God. He'd led them into Canaan to take their inheritance. He'd given them commandments, he'd given them laws, all these things that had been building into the life of Israel, yet they disobeyed him. They rejected him, and they rejected his leadership. They didn't want his authority. And sadly for me, as I, as I look back to Israel, and I look to us now, I see very, very little difference in many of the lives that we live, even as Christians. How many times do we reject what God says to us? We know what the truth is, we know what we should be doing, but still we reject it. We still don't want his authority over us. And as you know, and I've shared with you before, every book of Scripture has a melodic line, has a theme that runs through the book that helps us understand the, the, the complexity or the whole context of the book. Chapter 17, verse 6 of Judges is the melodic line. I'll read it for you. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. That's the central theme right through the book of Judges. Joshua brings up to, to God working in their lives, and Judges says they had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. That's the sadness of Judges, and it doesn't change even today. All these promises, the promised land. And then Joshua dies, and there's no leader. No leader stepped up. How sad is that for God's people? How sad is that even for us today? I'll be very out there, even politically now, and say, thank God right now we have a leader. Yes, we might not agree with everything he does, but thank God right now in our country we have a strong leader who's been able to take certain actions. I mean, we must be praying for him because I'm sure he's fighting battles we don't even see behind the scenes politically. But when we don't have strong leadership, our country will fall into, into disarray and chaos. Remember Timothy reminder, when Paul wrote to Timothy, reminder, pray for our leaders. If you want to live in peace and we without chaos to anarchy, pray for your leaders, that they would be good leaders. They had no good leader, no strong leader, and so they were compromised. Now when I talk about strong leadership, I'm not talking about arrogant, because sometimes we think leaders who are arrogant and out there and dictatorial and authoritative, those are the good leaders. They aren't always. I would rather talk of leaders who are strong in character. Good character, maybe godly character for us in the church. And if we don't have strong leadership, able to stand on their own two feet, able to make the decisions, able to to look at the vision of God, able to submit to God, then we are in trouble even as a church. And the Israelites were no different. They, They struggled with discerning what was right and what was wrong, what was good and what was evil, what was godly and what wasn't, was totally in chaos. And they started the slippery slope of disobedience to God. Questions were asked even when we looked at Timothy. Why did we deal did we deal so much in that series about leadership? Because leadership of the church is critical. 
Leadership in God's kingdom is critical. And Paul spoke so much about leadership and false teaching. And the Israelites were within that place because of the poor leadership and because of the assimilation of the Canaanite culture. The wrong teaching around God. And so they found themselves in some serious trouble. And I thought I would just touch on quickly this morning what happens when we get under the wrong leadership. And there's a progression for us. It's almost a a four-part journey for us. If we don't have strong leadership, as the Israelites had in the book of Judges, number one, the leadership is compromised. The leadership becomes compromised. And so when our leadership is compromised and they haven't had good teaching or they're not following God or they're of weak character, they themselves have built their own foundations, which are weak. And then we follow them. And so our leadership becomes compromised because we don't elect maybe the right leadership. And then secondly, our personal attitude then is compromised as well. Because we're following leadership that is compromised, our personal attitudes become compromised, and our attitude towards God is changed. And we begin to doubt God. Did God really say that? We see that right with Adam and Eve. Did God really say that? Our faith becomes compromised, and we become disobedient. And part of that compromising of our personal attitudes means that our attitude towards this becomes compromised. And our interpretation of this becomes compromised. Because our leaders aren't teaching what is here. Thirdly, as our personal attitude changes and is compromised, our values become compromised. Because our values aren't biblical anymore. Our values aren't godly. And just think of the world. I thought of three quickly. Of values that have changed over the last five years, some of them, and maybe over the last couple of hundred years. What about our families? The value of family, how has that been compromised over the last years? The role of husband and the role of wife. How have those been compromised over the years? How many families now have, in a way, the the wife is the head of the home and the husband has relinquished that role? That's not a godly home. But the roles have been reversed because our values have been compromised. What about children in our homes? Children want everything to be around them. In in my house, if you know, we, we do have a hierarchical system in our home. It's not dictatorial, it's hierarchical. Because that is God's way. Ultimately, I will be the spiritual head of the home and my wife submits to my spiritual leadership, not necessarily my physical leadership, because that's what people see that as. And the children will submit to that. Our home does not have a meeting like you see in American soap or or sitcoms. When people want to do something, everybody has a meeting and an indaba. It doesn't work like that. Our values have changed even within our families and we see them compromised because dads aren't taking their roles seriously. My favorite one of how our values have changed, this whole thing around gender. Our roles of our understanding of gender has been compromised, male or female, boy or girl. I tried to have a look on Friday. I was sitting um, typing and I thought, let's try and see how many genders there are. Even Google can't tell you. And Google knows everything. The one article said there were 52 genders. The other one, I thought, oh, that's that's pretty pretty interesting, 52 genders. The next one spoke of 71. Oh, no, this is getting ridiculous. The next article I read, 112. So I stopped Googling. 112 genders. How have our values changed? See, we've, we've allowed ourselves to come under false leadership. We've allowed ourselves to come under false teaching. What about morality and justice? What is right? What is wrong? What is good? What is evil? Really, today, it's whatever we think is right, is right. And that's how the world lives. This was happening to the Israelites, and they were in trouble. Our values are compromised, and then lastly, our defenses against evil, against sin, are compromised as well. Wrong leadership, personal attitudes have changed, values change. And then our defenses against sin change. And we don't, we don't allow God's word to speak into our lives. We become disobedient. And we follow the parts of God's word that we think suit us, and we don't want to follow the parts that we don't really like. How many times did God say to the people of Israel, when you take a new land, destroy them. Wipe them out completely. Nothing must be left. Man, woman, child, animal, nothing must be left. Wipe them out. 
How many times did they disobey? How many times did they do something else because they thought that was better than God's judgment? And we do exactly the same. Think about them. They had God's provision. They had God's providence. They had His protection. They had His power. They had His promises. Everything He said He would do, He had done. And they turned away. God had showed His unchanging attributes, His unchanging nature, His sovereignty, His righteousness, His grace, His power, His patience. But they turned away. Friends, I think we are still guilty of doing exactly the same thing. The nation of Israel, when they came to this book of Judges, had lost their first love. Who is your first love? I'm not talking about the first girlfriend you had or the first boyfriend you had. But your first love should be God. And we remember the first letter to the churches in Revelation. God, through John, writes to the church in Ephesus and says, you've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten God. Just as the Israelites had done. They'd lost their vision. How many churches, how many ministries do we know of today have lost their vision of becoming a people of purpose? That's what we are called to do. But how many times have we compromised and lost our vision? And they lost their purity. We are called to be pure. We are called to be holy. We are called to be set apart for God. But often we entertain other influences, other theologies, other teachings. We entertain them into what the Scripture says. We add to it and we subtract from it. And so we lose our purity in their head. And so Judges begins with compromise, this book, and ends with absolute confusion. The people of Israel didn't follow God. You can see for yourself, chapter 1, verse 1 of Judges. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who of us is to go up first to fight against the Canaanites? God had already said to them, this is who must go. You need to go and take the land. And now they're asking the question of God, well, well, who should go when he's already told them? That ends with confusion. Chapter 21, verse 25, the last line of the book of Judges. In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Exactly the same as we saw in the earlier chapter. Confusion. Nobody knows what to do. Everyone does what they think is right. How would our country be and it's on that road already, if everyone did what they thought was right. No laws, it would just be chaos and anarchy. And this is the pattern they find themselves in. Compromised integrity, compromised faith, paying the price for their sin and idolatry. The people of God. That's the same thing for me. This is the people of God. People of God practicing idolatry. And so as we go through the book of Judges, we're going to pick up repeatedly the cycle that they find themselves in. And we're in the exact same cycle even today. It begins with sin. Let me, let, let me read it for you. Chapter 3. We're going to bounce around a little bit because the introduction really takes three chapters to get right. Chapter 3 of Judges from verse 7. And this talks then about the first judge coming in. The Israelites did evil. Chapter 3, verse 7. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rehabitham, king of Aram Naharim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Kushan Rashi Hathim, it's a big word that's like wheelbarrow, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. In those few verses, we see the cycle that is repeated over and over and over through the life of the judges, and we'll see it repeated even today in our lives. Nothing changes. Scripture says there's nothing new under the sun. Well, there's sin. We do evil in the sight of the Lord. God is angry. And because he's angry, there's punishment. And because there's punishment, the people suffer. And so there's a crying out to the Lord. And then God has grace. And God is compassionate. And there's deliverance. And then there's peace for a short while. And then the cycle begins all over again. 
and we sin again, and God gets angry, and we cry out to the Lord, and He delivers us, and we have peace for a while. That is the cycle that has been since then, three and a half thousand years ago, and that cycle continues even today. Even today we find ourselves there. We allow God in, but we only allow Him into certain parts of our lives. We never submit, submit completely, and so we're in trouble. The Israelites were in the same place. Where do you fit in? On a practical note, where do you fit in this morning in this cycle? Sin, God is angry, are you crying out? Is there deliverance or are you at peace? Because we'll find ourselves, every one of us, in one of those places. Maybe in maybe two or three, where God is punishing in a way, but we are crying out and we're waiting for deliverance. And as I said, we're going to do seven weeks because seven times we see this cycle. And I'm sure it's happened far more. But in the book of Judges, we see seven cycles of the same happening and each judge comes. And so God sends a judge each time to help them. Now, when we understand judge in the book of Judges, it's not somebody who's going to come and look at what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong and sentence them. What it's actually saying is, I'm going to send a rescuer. I'm going to send somebody who's, in a way, the saviour of my people. They've been crying out to me and I'll send somebody who will rescue them out of the situation that they find themselves in. And so that's what we talk about when we look at judges. They're not there for the law, they're there to help God's people. And so let's just get in then to the book of Judges and head towards our first judge. Chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to read the first three verses to get started. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, Who will be the first to go up and fight for us against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah is to go. I've given the land into their hands. And then the men of Judah said to the Simeonites, their brothers, Come up with us into the territory allotted to us to fight against the Canaanites. We in turn will go with you into yours. So, that the, so the Simeonites went with them. Straight away, they, they compromise. Straight away, the Israelites would fall into this place of sin. God has told the, Ju- the Judah what to do. This is your job. You need to go. But they compromise their leadership. In a way, their weakness is revealed. They don't trust God. God says to them, you go in, you take the land, because I've already given you the land. And what do they do? They go to Simeon. And they say to Simeon, will you come and help us? How often do we do exactly the same thing? God says to us, I've given you everything you need to defeat this enemy. And then we find some other help to go with us. That's saying you can't ask for support, but you cannot fight the battle that God has given you by trying to get somebody else to help you. If God has specifically given you an instruction, they fail to obey Him. And because they fail to obey God through this whole time of the promised land, the Canaanites never disappeared. And ultimately, they remain the thorn in the flesh of the Israelites. We remember right in, it's interesting, my, my daughter actually found me during the week and said, Dad, can you explain to me why God was so angry with the Canaanites and why He said they needed to be destroyed completely? Interesting, while you're prepping this, your daughter finds you from Bloom and asks you exact, exactly the same question. We've got to go right back to Genesis. Genesis says the Canaanites worshipped false gods and God gave them a chance and a chance and a chance and eventually he said enough is enough. Wipe them out from the face of the earth. God is not just a God of grace, he's a God of wrath too. And God said wipe them out and they didn't. And they remained a thorn in the flesh of the Israelites. They refused to be defeated because the Israelites didn't do what God had said. And so Judah is tasked with destroying them and they ask Simeon. They say to Simeon, God's not enough for us. Yes, God said we can take these, but we're a little bit scared, we're a little bit nervous. Can you come and help us? Look what verse 4 says. They go there. When Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands. And they struck down 10,000 men at Bezek. You'd think when they get into this battle and they see not just the Canaanites falling, but the Perizzites falling as well, 10,000 men being killed, you'd think that the Israelites would say, maybe we could take courage from this. Maybe we should look at this victory and see, well, God is with us. But they don't. And we see from there this, this fall into disarray, this fall into chaos, and this fall into disobedience. And ultimately, nobody gets the job done. Move to verse 27 of chapter 1. I want to read it to you. 
And there's lots of big words in here. So let's see how we go. Chapter 1, verse 27. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Bethshan or Tanakh, or Dor, or Ibliam, or Megiddo, and their surrounding settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live on that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gaza, but the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nahalol, who remained among them, but they did subject them to forced labor. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon or Alab or Akzib or Helba or Aphek or Rehob. And because of this, the people of Asher lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath. But the Naphtalites too lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land. And those living in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became forced laborers for them. After that, nine tribes failed to do what God has told them to do. Nine tribes. This cycle of disobedience just continues. They're in the promised land. God has given it to them. God has said, you have the victory. You have my promises. You have my power. And you have my presence with you. Go and do it. Nine tribes out of twelve fail to do what God said they should do. And they just continue. Jump to chapter 3. We're going to pick up this section more next week. Chapter 3, verse 12. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. Just this continuation. Israel is in the cycle of sin. And God is angry. God is angry with them because of their sin. They've allowed themselves to be sucked in to the life of the Canaanites. Look, when we read from 27, that they allowed the Canaanites to live. They allowed the Canaanites to live. God had gave them strict instruction. Destroy them. A tribe after tribe, they allowed the Canaanites to influence them. And the locals slowly are assimilated into the life of the Canaanite people. They are pagans, they are idolaters, they are child um, killers in worship. And eventually the Israelites' devotion to God becomes um, syncretistic in a way, meshed into the Canaanite worship of their false gods. And ultimately, as we said earlier on, their purity is compromised. And they're worshipping false gods. And their whole lifestyle of godliness, their whole lifestyle of worshipping God is diluted. And I want to use the word inbreeding. Because we see it, eventually they started to marry into the, li- into the families of the Canaanites. The people that God said they should stay separate from, they begin to marry and they begin to have children. And slowly but surely, their own nation is becoming weakened. And they become apostate. In other words, they don't follow God's teaching and they sin. And we have to be so careful today and what I really enjoy about looking at judges, it gives us the opportunity to preach on sin. Because sin is the thing that distracts us from God. Sin is the thing that removes us from God's presence in a way. So we can't worship properly. And so we need to be looking at ourselves then at the two types of sin. Are we sinning deliberately? And when I look around this, there's few of you yeah, But I can guarantee you that some of you are sinning in these ways. These sins of commission. The things that we sin or we do Actively. How many of you right now are lying, cheating, stealing, coveting, gluttonous, pride, or adultery? That's just some. We look at the seven deadly sins. How many of us are involved in that? And I was thinking, how do we get changed in our thinking in these? Or we have teaching that says, you know, sometimes you lie to help or not to hurt people's feelings. There's a difference between lying and white lies. Is that not a compromise of our values? When we have people in the pulpit saying to you that, you know, if you don't want to hurt some people's feelings, just twist the truth a little bit. When you twist it a little bit, you might as well twist it a lot. 
What about adultery? This is one of my, my favorites. I'm struggling in my marriage. Let me go and see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist says, things are getting a little bit stale. Maybe you need to have an affair to spice your marriage up. Really? But we've done that. And it's out there. People are, are giving people that kind of advice. And we end up committing sins deliberately because we've been twisted. They may be our unconscious sins, the things we, we, we do without even realizing it. Maybe you think I'm going to say this because we, we don't always do it, but not coming to church to worship God regularly, I think is sinful because He calls us to worship together. And so not coming to worship together in the body, we are called to love Him and to love each other and we are called to build the church and to edify each other. If we don't come regularly, then we are part of that twisting and losing of our purity. Maybe in our giving. Maybe disobedient in baptism. All these things slowly change us. And we don't listen to God. And the Israelites were there. And they sinned against God and he hit that next cycle. The cycle of wrath. And God's wrath has come upon them. Wrath God comes upon people even today. And so how does he respond? He steps in and he punishes them. Let's go to chapter 2 from verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1 of Judges. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bokim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give your forefathers. He saying to them, I told you I would do this and I have done it. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall not make, another co- make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. So that was the command he said to them. You will not get assimilated into them. You will not be part of them. You need to destroy them completely. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? Now therefore I tell you that I will not drive them out before you. They will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud. And they called that place Bukim. And there they offered sacrifices to the Lord. God steps in. God punishes them. God says, you have been evil. Everything I've told you to do, you have not done it. You've begun to worship at their altars. You've begun to marry into them. And you've forsaken me. And, and I wonder for, for me, even when I look at myself personally, how long will it take before God says, I've got to step into your life? I've got to step in with punishment, not to destroy you, but I've got to bring this punishment to get you back on the road. Some of you would, would know my old friend Larry, who now lives in Australia. And Larry would regularly say to us, my children's wheel alignment has gone out a little. And they need a little bit of wheel alignment. And you know what that means? Just a swift smack on the backside. To get their wheel alignment right. I use an attitude adjusting snot clock. Sometimes that helps. But what it's actually saying is God says, I need to step in with some kind of punishment so that you will get your thinking right and you'll get back on, tr- on the right road. Back onto track in following me. God said, I told you what to do. You didn't do it. And he allowed them to be plundered and he allowed them to be sold into slavery to their enemies. I must ask myself a question. How terrible it must be to fall into the hands of an angry God. For us. How terrible would that be for us to fall into his hands? And stay caught in the cycle. And thank God they have the part of the cycle where they're able to cry out. God's punished them. Things have become really, really difficult. God has been harsh on them. They've been plundered. And they cry out to God. And God hears them. For me, that gives me so much, um, in a way, peace. That I can cry out, even in my sin, I can cry out to God and He will hear me. He won't turn His face from me. He won't say, I don't want anything to do with you. They cry out and He hears them and He sends a judge. He sends a rescuer. How many times are we going to call out and call out and God's not going to send because we're not in the place where He can yet? How many times are we, do we find ourselves in a jam because of our own sin or our own idiocy, stupid decisions. How many times will he allow us to be punished to learn our lessons? Here they are, the land of milk and honey. Supposed to be filled with abundance and goodness and peace. 
They find themselves a servant of a pagan king. And they realize they need to cry out. They need to call out to God. They need to repent of their sin. I know we shared a little bit around salvation. If you want to be fully saved, there has to be repentance. There has to be a confession of sin. And so they do that. They call out to God. Call out to this God who can deliver them. To repent of their sin. And God sends this judge. Othniel. And we don't know much about him. Let me read for you what we've read already. Chapter 3. The first judge arrives from verse 5. The Israelites lived among the... Look look who they live amongst now as you read this. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So how many ites there were left for them to live amongst and be marrying into. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, that he sold them into the hands of the king of Aram Naharim, Aram Naharim for eight years. You can read the rest. It's all those big words that I'm terrified of. But God sends eventually, he says, I need to help them. They've cried out to me. They've come to that place where they're beyond their own tether and they need me to step in. In a way, they're returning to God. Their compromised faith is being returned. Their trust in God is being renewed. And he said, yes, they've lived among them and they've married them and they've abandoned me and they've worshipped other gods. They've sinned, they've done evil, but it's time for me to raise up a rescuer. And his full anger is burnt out and so he rescues them. What do we know about Othniel? I've tried to find a lot of info on him, but there's very little. And even the scriptures give you this little passage, and in chapter 1 there's a touch on him. But what we do know is he's one of the better judges. We're going to look at Samson, and everyone thinks Samson was such a great fellow. Samson was an absolute rotter. And he was a good man, Othniel. He did what God asked him to do. So as we read in chapter 1, it says in verse 12 of chapter 1 that he was a man of great courage. I will give my daughter Akta in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Tiriath Sephir. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. And so Caleb gave his daughter Akta to him in marriage. Man of great courage. He did what was being asked of him. And he stepped up to what he was called to do. He was the family of Caleb. Now, we don't know, when you read it, it can be a bit confusing. Was he the nephew? Was he the son? The way the, the um, Israelite hierarchy sort of worked or lineage, he could have been either. But what we do know, he, he came out of the line of Caleb, the son of Jephani, and so his lineage was good. He was around 75 years old. But has to be going leading into battle to take a king at 75. When I look around here, some of you have passed that already. But is God still able to use you even now in your senior years? Are you still able, are you still willing to say, Lord, I cannot do all the physical stuff, but I can still do what you asked me to do? You know, Caleb was an old man when he got his share. Othniel, probably around 75. Is your age and your, um, where you are in life stopping you from serving God? Is it limiting your ability? We know too from reading here that Othniel trusted God. It says that the Spirit of the Lord, in chapter 3, verse 10, the Spirit of the Lord came on him and he became Israel's judge. He trusted the Lord enough to open up his life for God to pour his Spirit into him. Are you allowing God to do that? Are you trusting him enough today? And we know that he ruled Israel well. For 40 years, I mean, Israel was at peace. That's really what we know about him from looking at these scriptures. But God used this, this man, this retired man, to do what he wanted him to do. And I thought, well, we can't do much on Othniel to finish off this morning, but we can do another rescuer. We can do another judge that came very much like Othniel. We don't know too much of like where he was born, but we knew, do know that he was born in a stable. 
We do know that the first people that ever visited him were shepherds, the lowest of the low. We do know that he grew up unremarkably in Nazareth, not recognized by men and nothing to behold. We do know that the last three years of his life were spent as a homeless wanderer, preaching. We do know that he was accused of blasphemy ultimately and sentenced to death. And we do know that ultimately he died on a cross. This man, unremarkable in any way in the eyes of men, came as God's rescuer to settle God's wrath on a disobedient people. Think about it. God uses unremarkable to do his work, to do his work. And this unremarkable man rescued God's people for all eternity. We know who he is. The question we must ask us this morning, and having this small group and knowing most of you, you do trust in this man. You do trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But what about those out there? How much time are we spending talking about this rescuer? How much time are we talking about this judge who was sent? How much time are we spending sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? If we're going to be Christ-centered or gospel-centered, Christ-focused, how much time are we spending sharing him? God used an unremarkable man by the name of Othniel and he used Ehud and Deborah and Samson and Gideon, unremarkable people, to save his people. Maybe God's got a plan for you and me this morning. Unremarkable but we're part of his plan of salvation for somebody. And he's calling on us to share it. Judges is a book of destruction and compromise and sin and disobedience and evil. But it's also a book of a God who loves his people. And constantly, time after time after time, says, I will send somebody and I will save them. It's been prayer for our nation. It's been prayer for our people even now that God would rescue us. We have ultimate rescue through Christ. But what about the situations we find ourselves in now? Are we going to trust Him? Are we going to destroy the things in our lives that we should, that He's told us to destroy? Or are we going to hold on to them? Are those little things in your life stopping God from being able to do everything that He wants to do? Because we're disobedient and we have sinned. Maybe the time of punishment is coming where we will have to cry to him. You'll have to evaluate your own life as I have to evaluate mine. Let's pray. Lord, as we look at this book, Lord, I'm just so aware that many times my name could be written where the word Israel is written. Lord, that I'm no different from them. I'm constantly moving in this cycle. Lord, I pray that your faithfulness to me would help me in my journey. As I would pray for everyone sitting here, pray for everyone who is listening, everyone who is watching at home, that your faithfulness would work in us. To remind us that, Lord, the the phase we find ourselves in, in, in life right now could be through our own doing, but also to be reminded that you have, you have done everything that is needed for us to live lives that are victorious. For us to become that people of purpose, submitted and consecrated to you. Lord, thank you that we, are, we have not been left alone. Thank you that even in this time of being separated from loved ones and from friends, we are not alone, for you are with us. Thank you that the psalmist um, David wrote that your rod and your staff will protect us and comfort us. Thank you that we have that even now. Let us leave this building and let us live in our homes and leave our homes through the week as we go out as people of victory. People of purpose, people of power, people who live under the promise of God. Lord, let us not become disobedient. Let us not lose our purity. Let us not lose sight of our first love. Lord, help us to remember who you are. Help us to repent of what we have done and help us to return to you. And so we bless your word to you, ask that it will achieve every good purpose that you have for it. Let it not return void to you. 
but let it inspire and teach. And so we bless you for today as we could meet together. We do pray your protection upon us as we go out. But Lord, more than that, we ask that your grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ would be with us. That the love of God the Father would cover us. And that the Holy Spirit, Lord, would equip us to do what you've asked us to do. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. I hope to see you again next week. Next week we move into one of my favorite passages where we look at Eglon and Ehud and how God works out his rescue of his people. Enjoy your week and we'll see you next week.